The topic of today's discussions uh, is around architecture and its relationship to the economic forces which shape how land is developed and how to take agency in this process. Before we begin, it is important to take a moment and acknowledge the long pre-colonial history of this place that we are in and consider how this history should inform our relationship to the land which is so central to these discussions. Even though we're meeting across Southern Ontario and across the continent, we want to acknowledge that the University of Waterloo School of Architecture is situated on the Haldeman Tract, land that was promised to the Six Nations of the Grand River and on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We hope that by highlighting the complex economic and financial forces which impact the way so that we develop and build on the land, the discussions today can empower the students and professionals represented here to act with greater agency and responsibility in their future endeavors. We would also like to take a moment as the organizing team to reflect on our role in planning this event. We feel that it is important to acknowledge that there is a lack of cultural, racial, and gender representation in the panel. As the organizing team, we would like to offer our sincerest apologies for this oversight on our part. At the same time, we want to recognize that the six panelists joining us today have all done exceptional work in their respective fields. We are grateful to them for lending us their time and their insight, and we hope that our negligence does not prevent this from being an informative and productive discussion for everyone. We also hope that this moment will be a wake-up call for all of us to challenge how we think about and organize these important discussions in the future to increase the diversity and representation in our discussions. Jane Hutton, graduate officer and a member of the University of Waterloo School of Architecture's Racial Equity and Environmental Justice Task Force, would like to share a few words. Hi everyone, I just, um, I'm Jane Hutton, and I, I just wanted to follow up. I think Wayne, Wayne said it very well. Um, I wanted to thank Wayne, Alice, and Levi for this like super thoughtful curation of the symposium and, and their uh, desire to bring, you know, content that that isn't typically in the school to the school. Um, uh, and just in response to the like panel configuration, I think it's important um, uh, like number one to kind of recognize that I that I think as a graduate office, we saw this as as something that was going to be very student led but i think we forgot to, we forgot to reflect on on how organizing events is a very complex thing then we should be in more discussion about it so moving forward we're definitely going to be um providing more feedback or like having a discussion uh, with the students who are going to be making calls for fall symposia to think about you know uh, how ideas are reflected in panel members and, and how that can also enrich in the, the discussion. So that's one thing, but I also just really want to thank the students for um, who raised their concerns and also um, Wayne, Alice, and Levi for a really, really thoughtful, you know, kind of grappling with this because I feel like if anything, you know, if we are all as a community all um, trying to grapple with the way that biases, racial and uh, racial biases and different inequities are kind of really pervasive in all in every aspect of our lives and education system. That these kinds of um, discussions or these kinds of comments, critiques, uh, like awkward moments are going to happen all the time there if we're if we're kind of committed to this kind of change that it's going to involve like I, I find this awkward it's, it's challenging you know um we really want to be so grateful to the speakers but we also want to address concerns that are being made so so i guess i just want to uh, participate in this ongoing never-ending continual practice of raising these issues uh, because we need to do it kind of every day all the time so thanks so much for everyone for coming to this and thanks for the organizers for this amazing work of bringing us all together. Thanks Jane. I really appreciate your comments uh, there. So our morning session today um, is focused on the question of how architects can self-initiate projects. I think we're very fortunate that we have a group of panelists with us this morning who have been involved in a variety of self-initiated ventures that range from the scale of individual dwellings to multi-unit residential buildings. 
I think as they share their work with us, we'll be motivated to think about ways that we can have greater agency as designers of the built environment. And so without further ado, I'll let Atlas introduce our panelists. So, hello everyone. So first we'll have an introductory remark by John McMinn. John McMinn is an architecture professor at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture and is a graduate of Architecture Association at McGill University. He has taught and lectured at a variety of schools of architecture in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. He is a principal and founder of the Toronto-based architecture practice, MJ Architecture, whose portfolio include building, public space design, exhibition, and art installation. Please welcome John. Thanks, Alice. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I've got to figure out how to see um, both the... Um, my notes and, and the screen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and to welcome our speakers and acknowledge the important work uh, the organizers of the symposium, Alice, Levi, and Wayne are doing to bring some focus to the question of the relationship between finance and the process of development that shapes our urban environment. But before discussing the symposium, however, I wanted to acknowledge, as Jane has just done, um, that they're here at the university, um, the calls for action to increase diversity and dismantle barriers of systemic racism are acutely heard. And we're all learning a lot in examining what we can do uh, in the context, in this context within the School of Architecture and the larger university environment. Conversations in the professional practice course earlier this spring in part got the ball rolling for this event, prompted by a talk given by Waterloo Art Economics Professor Larry Smith, one of today's speakers, encouraging students to embrace their own agency in defining the profession and the industry they choose to work in. Larry's talk, as well as other conversations related to diversity, have prompted students uh, to think about what it would take, <clears throat> what, what, uh, thinking what it would take to enable them to be more active drivers in their careers and, and this symposium, as well as a parallel self-directed course, a group of students have initiated on finance and development with a focus on affording housing affordability is a positive and declarative step they're taking in this direction. I also wanted to give a big thanks to our speakers who have generously agreed to contribute, their, uh, to, contribute to today's event. John Van Nostren will speak, be speaking about his concept of flexibility in residential, residential unit ownership with his new firm, Parcel Developments, with the concept of enabling people to expand, their contact, contra, their, their contra, expand and contract their living space through an aggregate parcel ownership of space in multi-unit residential properties. Michael Leckie will speak about the integrated design approach of his architecture and design studio with its plus visual internal uh, digital visualization lab, which allows for an integrated workflow for testing and evolution of design ideas in the developments of their projects. This afternoon, Peter Clues will discuss the work of Architects Alliance, whose portfolio of work over a couple of decades has significantly transformed the Toronto urban landscape, bringing an elevated level of design and technical innovation to the city's multi-unit residential sector. John Filippetti at Oxford Properties, uh, Toronto offices, represents a global enterprise in the operation that's lasted for over 50 years with headquarters in Toronto, London, Luxembourg, and New York, taking a long view in property and community development. Larry Smith, as I mentioned earlier, uh, an economics professor here at the University of Waterloo, has been encouraging students uh, for, and graduates for over two decades is prompting to students uh, to think about how they can shape the future in the profession that reflects the society of which it serves. By way of an introductory in introduction today, I wanted to mention a couple of examples of work in the development industry that I think points to a positive direction for the future. An example of this is found in Waterloo architecture graduate Mazar Mordazavi, who leads task developments. And who recalls the challenge of Larry Smith offered to students uh, to reflect on their agency in shaping the professional world they are entering when he, Majar, was in the professional practice course at Waterloo a few years ago, about 15 years ago, I should say. I've invited Majar to speak at the school of, at, uh, to the master students several times in the past couple of two or three years in the hope of demonstrating to some of the potential, some of the potential that Larry speaks about in terms of the question of agency and the role that um, we can play in the professional world that we are entering uh, as we leave the School of Architecture. 
Maggiore's parents both trained as architects in Iran, and after arrival in Canada, when work in the architectural profession was scarce, they began building custom homes, laying a foundation in the next generation with Maggiore, who sees himself in the role of an outsider and a disruptor to what traditionally has been, was a WASP-dominated culture of development of the development industry in Toronto. The team at TAS has consciously been assembled, aiming to, at gender equity and an attempt to reflect some of the diversity of the Toronto demographics. Upon assuming the role as president and CEO of the firm and shifting from custom home building to condominium development, Major has been working at implementing ideas from his UW MArch thesis, thinking about the building of healthy, resilient neighborhoods, tweaking development strategies from the model of exclusively private condo ownership and commercial grade level retail, to inclusion of substantial rental accommodation and public facilities like libraries and food distributing distribution, demonstrating that despite the conservative nature of capital, private development can leverage and foster alternatives which help to build resilient communities. On another note, speaking of disruptors, the announcement a few days ago that an electric car company of all things has recently assumed the mantle of the world's highest net worth auto manufacturer speaks to the fact that when the situation demands it, things can move quickly, more, even more quickly than we might have thought possible previously. There was an announcement uh, last year by Urban Capital Property Group, a leading Toronto development firm, of a project in the west end of Toronto called Reina Condominiums, which is the first housing development in Canada led by an all-women team, provoking a questioning of the male dominance in the industry. Led by Taya Cook, who you can see uh, in the middle of the screen here, and um, Sherry Larjani of Spotlight Developments. Uh, the group includes architects, engineers, planners, landscape architects, legal, final, financial, marketing, and construction individuals, with the aim not to exclude men, but rather to showcase the talents of women in the industry and demonstrate a model for others to follow. A CBC News item by Taylor Simmons cites that, according to Statistics, statistics Canada in 2018, women make up 18% of Toronto's residential building construction industry. Sherry Larjani writes, uh, we're trying to prove and trying to show that we're here and we love to do this. And this is a viable option for young girls. If they decide that this is the path they want to pursue, then get involved and do it. Another interesting example of property development is the not-for-profit not real estate company, New Commons Development, based in Vancouver and Toronto, that builds, preserves, uh, builds and preserves, uh, preserves affordable housing and community real estate. Their goal, uh, stated in their website, is to keep community-owned assets in the hands of communities. A recent project reflective of its community context in Vancouver is a 17-story wood tower that includes 13,000 square foot LGBTQ community center as the two-story grade level face of the development which is located in the eastern boundary of downtown Vancouver in the Davie Village area. The upper levels of the development will provide affordable housing and support services for families and individuals living with HIV AIDS. Newcomers are also looking outside large urban centers with their small communities initiative, aiming to assist small and remote rural communities to build affordable housing. Uh, New Commons share their share risk um, in these development projects um, with both professional input and capital with nonprofits, co-ops and public sector partners in the aim of enhancing local financial and uh, local financial and development capacity. So while there's plenty of room for progress in the development industry towards inclusion and diversity, a step that I'm excited about is seeing our students engage with the industry and start to imagine how they can contribute and I'm delighted to see them doing that with an event like this today. So thanks once again to Alice, Levi, and Wayne for putting together this event, and I look forward to the presentations of our speakers. Thanks. Thank you, John, um, for the introductory remark. That is a great preface uh, to the conversation today for our symposium. Um, so next we have John Van Ostrom. Um, John Van Ostrom is an architect, planner, and founder of a 40-year-old consulting practice named SVN Architects and Planner. He has pioneered new approaches to land development and housing in areas of rapid growth throughout greater Toronto region, across Canada, 
and in developing cities across Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. In 2015, John founded Parcel Development, which is currently developing two condominium projects in Hamilton for household earning annual income ranging from 25,000 to 100,000. John was awarded the Jane Jacob Award for Ideas That Matter in 2004. Please welcome John. So I, I thought it was interesting that John was talking about practices um, as opposed to projects. Um, and I think the essence of my introduction is that it's about, it is about practice as much as it is about projects. So I know we have a questioning period and I will end up by talking a bit about more precisely what we're doing. But I think what's important is the sort of context for this discussion as a whole. Uh, and I'd like to get, present a kind of broader overview, especially as the first speaker of the day, uh, to the situation that we find ourselves in as architects at the moment, and, and this topic being very timely. Uh, um, I, was, I was particularly struck by the, by the um, clause in your introduction, in your overview that we, you suggested we talk about the co-relative values of architecture and economy. So very much, I think that economy has been a huge element of our work. Um, and we've gone where we work is places where economies are growing or being created and, 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 and urbanization is happening at large and, and architecture is happening. Coincidentally, we live in one of those regions now, which wasn't the case 40 years ago and is up and down since, but we live in a, in a, a, a rapidly growing part of the world. Maybe it's slowed down a bit, but we're still, we're still probably the main country for immigration. And immigration is what has driven our growth and our country. Um, and I think we sometimes forget that. And we probably are one of the best countries in the world to immigrate to, if I may, may say so, or we have been, and we're getting better and better. Um, as we realize what we have to offer, what the situation is. And I actually serve as an advisor to a group called the Century Initiative. And the Century Initiative says, we should be 100 million people by 2100 for a variety of reasons. They're mostly economists themselves, but the reasons are that we need to, our, our, con our population's concentrated at sort of one end and we, we have been very poor more recently about our accommodation of immigrants. So there are a lot of people who want to come, but it's, it's been quite regulated. Just, just on that theme, I, I've always thought there's a profound difference before and after 1950 in our environment here. So before 1950, we had major, major immigration. And I'm, I'm talking about the Toronto region here. We had the largest uh, amount of immigration we've ever had since, including current. Um, it was largely driven by British immigrants or immigrants from the UK. Um, and it was supported by a government that, that surveyed, prepared the land in advance of that for settlement. So I, I characterize it as being kind of a period of settlement, but we have to remember that it was all planned and surveyed by the British government before that. So there was an infrastructure ahead of time it didn't include housing, uh, other than it said that you got, when you went to take up a lot, you were given two years as a right to occupy the lot within which you had to build a 16 by 20 minimum house that once you'd built, you could become the owner of that lot. So very, very interesting practice, which is still in play in, in, in many parts of the world as a way of, of moving from entry into ownership. Um, so, but build, building wasn't the issue. It wasn't, even, wasn't much architecture. The surveyors were the kings. Um, and in fact, my family came here during that period or before that, quite a bit before that period and have always been surveyors. So I have a kind of, um, but, but when I was in school studying, I was told that the development before 1950 was unorganized and confusing and messy. And, uh, and at that time, I thought messy was a bad word. I now think messy is a good word. But um, it, was, it was mayhem, I was told, I, as, I was, as I was taught. And that what was really happening, which in that period was sort of, what should I say, is post-1950, is that people were, working, were working, moving into fully planned development. That was the term that was used, fully planned development. 
and that the principles of that were derived. We always we had English planners until we were until 1972 in most cities in Canada. So we had an English planner at that point who just completed a plan for London in 1943. And the plan said the old city is a bad place. In fact, it's so bad we should tear down large parts of it and build something called public housing, which happened first in London. And the rest of us should all move out and live in garden suburbs. So the 1945 plan for Toronto was based on that exact principle. Take the old city, tear down big chunks of it. The chunk we know most obviously is Regent Park, but that was a tenth of what was supposed to be torn down, just to put it in perspective. And we all moved, began to plan and move out to seven uh, garden suburbs, the most famous of which was Don Mills. Um, and the whole principle of that was unlike the go as you grow uh, settlement process of pre-1950, this would be fully planned, fully organized. In fact, all houses would be finished, full infrastructure was in, the whole thing was ready to go. But what but they, they also, and, and the whole idea was not to go back in the city at all, we, to re make sure you, you, you actually didn't rely on the city to any extent. And each of those communities had an employment area and the employment areas uh, for Don Mills, in that case, one of the people there came to the developers at the time, oh, by the way, you all had to go, you, you could change, you could only change your house with permission from the developer and the developer would only allow three colors grass green, sky blue, or earth brown, I think it was, uh, as, as to put your fence in or whatever you needed. But if somebody came from the deployment area and said, hey, uh, you know, I, I bought a site on, on Winford Drive. Um, I love Don Mills. I've got a house here. My senior managers have a house here. But uh, I need 100 people to make widgets, 100 laborers. And, and, and Mr. Taylor, uh, you're least expensive house can only be afforded by the top 35% of the population. So there's nowhere for them to live. So we have to go back in the city and come out. And that, that led to the very, very long process. And I, we don't have time to talk about that right now, but to actually somebody saying, and all the architects and planners were there as well, because the idea of building a complete town from scratch that was finished was hugely, hugely attractive. But the fact was it didn't accommodate 65% of the population. So they ended up copying a Swedish plan by buying a thing someplace called Thorncliff Race Racetrack and building Thorncliff as a high rise development outside, not just Don Mills proper, but the other side of the employment areas. And that model of 65% living in towers, um, which was, and it's a town copied from Sweden, which was in the same, Grow, growing in the same kind of period uh, has, has, has extended, um, it, 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 it extended into Canada copying actually a, a, what was called a workers settlement, which is what, and it was exactly what uh, uh, Thorncliffe was modeled on. And there were 20, Don Mills was copied 20 times in the next 20 years, and therefore we had what happened was it grew out of that, as we know from Mr. Holchansky, who's mapped the changes in incomes in that period, that whole part of the city, which is two thirds of the city, is now the largest extent of poverty in the city. Not because the 30% are in poverty in Don Mills, but because in the area as a whole, there's 65% who are struggling and have continued to struggle. And it's exactly the same. I happened to go to Vallingby, Sweden a year ago and to see what was happening there. And it's exactly the same situation, really. So the fully planned uh, approach was great for some people, except that it excluded 65% of the population. So if we jump forward. I mean, I think it really, really explains the situation we're in now uh, of 65% of the population still not having access to proper housing or housing of, of, of any sort. So that's, that's kind of, I'm sorry, it's long winded, but it, 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 it's, it's the sort of context within which we are, we are working. And I just say on the economic side to, to paint, you know, obviously the, the growth plan, there's dramatic change here in 2006 with a growth plan, because it's the first time somebody ever said in a planning chair, and it wasn't a Brett for the first time as well, said, 
hey, 40% of all new development from, 19, from 2006 on needs to be within the existing built up area and the other 60 can remain greenfields. In 2017, that became 60% being within the existing built up areas and 40 being greenfields. That, so that changed the perspective enormously because you're now building 40% of the population, now 60% are on top of what already exists. So we're into, a, we're into something that's not really been acknowledged, the planning regime, the official plan as it was called uh, from 1945 on, which was a very colonial term by the way, the official plan was a, all African countries, British colonies we've worked in have an official plan because if they had a prop, if they broke the, the British would leave the plan in place, go home. If the people wanted to change the plan, they had to go to London and get it changed. We still have that official plan. It's a totally useless document and in, in 40 years of practice in Toronto itself and Hamilton, I would say that 98% of the projects have required an official plan amendment and rezoning. So what the hell are planning and rezoning doing for us? They're actually holding us back enormously. So what does that mean at an economic level? I think it's interesting, we, just to give you an example, we went to the home builders, uh, Toronto home builders as an example, we've gone to a number of home builders in other cities too, but say, what, what's going on here? Like what's, what's the balance between new construction and renovation and additions? Uh, because we were interested in, in who's doing what. And they came back and said, they said, well, why do you want to know that? I said, well, we just want to know what, what's being spent on what. They came back and said, actually, it's for every dollar spent on new development in Toronto, and that's billions of dollars, by the way, as, as, as you all know, there's a dollar 25 being spent on renovations and additions. And we said, what, you know, how, how could that be? You, you, I mean, there's more money in that than there are. So the builders, that is the non-developer, the builders are actually building more than the developers are building. The developers are doing 35%. The builders sometimes work for developers, but a lot of times don't. And they're building, and not only that, you know, we asked, so 125, where did you get the 125 from? Well, we went to the built, we went, we looked up the building permit costs, and we could tell from that what the value of renovations and was in additions. And I said, well, do you think that people who renovate going to Home Depot are always going for a building permit? They said, well, yeah, they are. I said, well, no, they're not. I don't think they are. In fact, we have done some interviews and, and why is Home Depot, the Home Depots of the world flourishing at that point? It's because it turned out that the builders actually went to uh, uh, Altus to do a study of this, of informal growth within Toronto, not to promote it, but actually on behalf of the develop of the builders to say, hey, these guys are getting away with all this without having to pay proper taxation. And they Altus did a study and came back and said, well, at, at the 125 figure, you're not including 40% of all the building that's happening without building permits. So that's an enormous amount of money that's being spent by builders, by homeowners, by lots of different kinds of people and not necessarily in a good way. I mean, people are using it to add on to their house and change room configurations, but a lot of it is illegal. Uh, technically, the city, you know, the, 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 in 2014, that when the city legalized basement apartments, which had been legal, they created 14,000 units overnight in one change of legislation. You can imagine a legislation that sort of started to legalize, started to broaden the definition of legalization. And I think that has a lot. So I think a lot of our work is to do with uh, working on the planning and um, um, zoning regimes, because I think we understand this gets, this gets back to, so what, what are the, where are the architects in all this? A few years ago, I gave a talk at Waterloo on the 26 stages of putting up a building. It starts with buying land, ser, you know, servicing, getting all, all the different approvals that are required, the servicing, the ownership, the marketing, et cetera, et cetera. And the last thing that happens is you go to an architect to build the building. And my argument in the lecture there was, Actually, each of those 26 stages is as influential on the product as, as is the architect. Uh, it's, we're already, we're starting with all kinds of a whole situation that we haven't been involved in. And I think that 
the architect, but as, as the last person, so we can use that as sort of arrogantly and say, well, we get to do the rose on the plant that's planted deeply below us and we get to make a rose that whatever we, what's important, or we can say, well, actually we could be doing better as architects if we could be involved from the beginning forward. And in fact, I will use the example of my grandfather and I probably, well, how's my time? I'm sure I'm wandering over time, but I got a picture of my grandfather graduating as a surveyor in 1898 at U of T with 30 other men sitting on steps in front of some building. And it said the School of Practical Sciences. And I said, what? That, that was that's been some kind of club to my aunt who gave me the picture. I said, he was, a, he was an engineer, he was a surveyor, he was an engineering. She said, no, no, that's his graduation picture. So I looked up the School of Practical Sciences and it includes civil, structural, mechanical, uh, electrical engineering, surveying, planning, landscape architecture, architecture, urban economics, and all the other sciences, and I would add the word now arts, required to make better cities, was a statement in 1898. What happened between there and 1950 is that all those people set up or separate organizations uh, and, and, and competed with each other for what their role was in that building process. So we now have a process where architects fight against their consultants, consultants were all fighting our, develop, our contractors. How, how do we possibly create a decent, uh, create dif, dif, decent city and decent buildings in that kind of environment? I say we can't. Um, and I say we're not. Um, and I'll just go on to sort of conclude, I guess, 15 minutes is not what I'm used to talking. Um, is to say that, so we're doing, a, we're doing a building, it all goes back to me to the fact that development is to do with land, infrastructure, and building, those three components. And you, I don't believe you can look at any one of them without the other two in play. That is, and I think the architect on the building side, the architecture, the architects are the best people to sort of see that and, and bring that out, quite frankly. I don't want to be, and I say that in a modest way, I believe it's a public service, not out of arrogance, that we, we have a, we are people who actually see from beginning to end. Um, and therefore, uh, and, and, and given that I also think that developers are really, anybody who owns a piece of land, any builder, or any of the formal developers. There are developers, all of, all of those people out there are developers. We need to help them. We need to sort of, in a way, I'd say free them out of the confines of the, of the, the old British scheme, colonial scheme that we've got locked into not just First Nations, but also ourselves and also immigrants. We're all caught up in that. Um, and, and the way we're doing it is we're saying, okay, we're, we're building buildings that we, we just we focus on the structure of the building. Um, and in fact, we're changing the structure of the taller buildings because the old, the old towers that, that were built invented by somebody called Luc Corbusier. Um, um, they, they were always built, or are still built to this day with sheer wall construction, meaning that the party walls are built as part of the structure of the building, which reduces cost, speeds up things, speeds up timing. But what it means is you have to guess at the outset what the composition of, of units will be in the building, and it's always wrong. So we said, well, why don't we actually look, go back to Le Corbusier and look at the Maison Domino, uh, which was a structural uh, reinforced concrete structure, then which is really what I would call the retail structure we live in today, where you have a column slab. We subdivide our floors into lots, the smallest lot is 250 square feet or 300 square feet. And, and Purchasers, purchasers can buy, buy one, two, one, two three, four, four whatever number of lots they want. They can take, they can take those lots in either, either basic, basic form, form, which means form of form that's inevitably habitable. So a basic, basic washroom, washroom, kitchen, kitchen in place, um, and, and, and it finishes, and, finishes, and, then, and then they can finish, finish it off over time, over time or not, or not, as they feel, 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 feel uh, very sorry about that. And, and we'll, we'll kind of reconvene with John's comments later on. Um, 
very interesting right as it started cutting off. Um, Alice, if you could maybe introduce our next speaker and we'll, we'll continue on to the next talk for now. Okay. Um, so although John's not here, thank you for um, the talk. And it's very much, a, oh, he's back. Okay. Um, thank you, John, for the talk. And um, it's very much how architects are taking the agency to work with rather than against our ally consultant. And it's very fundamental and very insightful. Um, so next up, we have Michael Lecky. Michael is the principal and creative director of Lecky Studio, a multidisciplinary practice that operates at the intersection of design, art, and architecture. Although formerly trained as an architect, Michael is all, has always held an equal interest in design disciplines that lies outside of traditional architectural discourse, industrial design, environmental design, and communication design. The goal of the practice is to challenge norm and convention using a design research methodology for the production of work that is both disruptive and thought provoking. Unlike most traditional architecture practice, much of the work of Lecky Studio is understood as a type of design research and experimental enterprise that is self-initiated and or self-funded. Please welcome Michael. Great, thank you, Alice. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. So, you know, when I started thinking about this idea of columns and capital uh, and what I could offer that might be interesting and perhaps even inspiring to, uh, to an emerging group of, of architecture students, I was reminded of one of the most inspiring moments that I had as a student um, when I attended a lecture by the Austrian architect Dietmar Eberle. And, you know, it's interesting. It's only in retrospect that you think back uh, and you, you reflect and remember the things that struck you uh, at a certain time and place and that have, you know, stuck with you uh, throughout all the years since. So Everlay opened his lecture with a simple question. He said, what is the single most important aspect of a work of architecture that will determine its longevity or allow it to be enduring? Uh, you know, it was a, a more traditional setting. People were, were there uh, in person. And so many people put up their hands and, uh, you know, people said, well, it's, it's about sustainability. Other people said it's about structure and the robustness of structure. Other people said it's, a, it's about the quality of materials um, and, and so on and so forth. And there were a number of uh, kind of ideas that were put forward. And at the end of it, um, Eberle paused for a minute and he said, actually, the one thing that creates and facilitates enduring architecture is love. More specifically, that the work of architecture is love. And it's this quality that will facilitate the architecture's existence, its maintenance, its preservation, and ultimately even the kind of restoration and reconstruction in the event that it should be destroyed due to war, fire, or natural disaster. So I'd like to start my talk here with a not too dissimilar question, which is, you know, in the context of, you know, this discussion today and this symposium, what is the single most important currency in the profession of architecture and more specifically for a group of prospective young architects? So we can't really in this context have a, have a kind of Q&A here. So I'll just jump right into it. And, and I would argue that it's not US dollars, it's not euros, um, it's not even the Canadian dollar as a currency. Rather, the most important currency in the profession of architecture really is opportunity and agency. Um, more specifically, the opportunity to practice our craft, to bring beauty into the world, um, and the opportunity to envision a future, um, you know, and contribute uh, to the realization of that future. Um, so, you know, in all of this, we start to think, what is the role of the architect? Uh, and I would suggest and argue that the role of the architect then is to imagine a possible future. You know, when I say architect, really what I'm, what I'm talking about is the idea of, you know, an architecture team, an architecture culture, um, all of us, uh, you know, practicing in the field of architecture. So really I, I should say maybe perhaps what is the role of architecture? So it's not only to imagine a possible future, but it's to realize a possible future and bring that future 
you know, into reality. So the title of my talk is um, Speculation or Speculative Architecture. So when we think about the idea of speculation or when you Google speculation, um, really you come up with two entries. You know, it's a noun uh, and number one, the forming of a theory uh, or conjecture without firm evidence. Well, this sounds a lot like imagining a possible future and like I think truly visionary architecture, you're imagining a future that doesn't exist yet. You're speculating about what that future could be and you're making a leap of faith into uh, this kind of unknown realm and testing ideas. The second more mundane idea of speculation is really, you know, item two here, which is the investment in stocks, property, or other ventures in hope of gain, but with the risk of loss. Now, it's interesting to think about that second, well, it's, it's interesting to think about both of these ideas. Um, really, the second one uh, as I tell my clients at whatever scale we're working at, but, you know, unexpectedly at the scale of custom single family homes, um, you know, if they are coming to work with an architect, this is an inherently incredibly risky proposition. So here we have a client, typically a family, you know, they have a nest egg and, you know, as we understand in urban centers in Canada, uh, not only is land incredibly expensive, but the cost of construction is also incredibly expensive. So, you know, people are coming to architects and, you know, I think that, you know, John's question about, you know, to what extent are architects actually involved in the emergent fabric of the city is a very relevant one. You know, when you're building a custom single family home, you are operating, you know, in a bubble within a bubble. But notwithstanding, you know, these clients, they come to architects and they say, here is my nest egg, you know, the entirety of my life savings. Uh, and they could take that nest egg, they could say, I want three bedrooms, I want a rec room, meeting room, home office, and they could go out into the world and find that, walk through it, know exactly what they're getting, exactly what the price is, potentially even negotiate a little and, and move in, you know, within a month or two months. When you hire an architect, you're actually coming to that, that practice and saying, here is the entirety of my savings, my nest egg, you know, and I'm trusting you with the most important aspect of the life of myself and my family, quite arguably. And the architect says, don't worry, it's going to be great. And, and really, that's the promise. Um, so I would argue here, and, and hence the, the, the title of my talk, which is Speculative Architecture, that all architecture is speculative. And really, what I am going to offer today is, through my practice, three very quick case studies or example projects of how I've understood that approach um, as a relatively young practice, uh, five years old, um, you know, to find opportunities to contribute, to start a dialogue, to be part of a dialogue um, across a variety of scales. Uh, and I think it's really important because, you know, you can understand the process of professional development as moving from architectural education, uh, graduating, working at a firm, uh, you know, earning your, your internship hours across the wide spectrum of professional tasks, writing your exams, becoming registered and hanging out your shingle. Well, as someone who actually started a practice, my first independent practice, 10 years ago, literally on the eve of the last global financial crisis, I will tell you it is much more difficult than that. You know, you go through all of these steps, all of these hurdles, you pass all of these benchmarks, hit all these milestones, you know, and finally you hang out your shingle and then you just stare at the phone while it doesn't ring. Or you check your empty inbox, uh, wondering where all the clients are and you feel you have the experience, the capacity to practice and yet, the single biggest challenge at that point is how to find opportunities. So I think it's a very timely discussion as we're arguably in, you know, the, the kind of, you know, single greatest uh, financial crisis um, perhaps ever, um, but certainly uh, since the last one that we saw in the, in the last 10 years. So I want to start this discussion by just very simply uh, looking at the traditional structure of owner, builder, and architect. 
okay? And we're gonna understand the role of the architect in relation to the fields in which we operate. So in the traditional, in the traditional kind of diagram or scheme, you have you know, owner, builder, architect. If the architect is acting as the architect and the builder, we have a design build model. If the architect is operating as the architect and the owner, we have a design for self model. And this is a very interesting model. Um, you know, although it typically requires a significant amount of, you know, your own capital to get going, you would build a small house or a small cabin, and that might launch an architecture practice. Uh, again, very intensive in terms of the resources required. Lastly, we have the traditional developer model where really you see the owner and the builder, uh, quite often a single entity, um, you know, coming to the architect and the architect providing uh, design vision and guidance um, uh, for, for land development, speculative land development. Really, I think what we're talking about here in the idea of an architect as developer model or in the idea of um, practicing from a point of agency and in a self-initiated manner, we're understanding how the architect actually operates at the intersection of all of these spheres. And really the three case studies that I'm quickly gonna walk through um, are an example of the role of the architect expanding into these other two spheres. So while we have architect as developer as the sort of currently understood way of, of engaging at the, at the intersection of the nexus of these spheres, I will also suggest uh, that there are, there are many other models. The two, the two other ones that I will talk about today are architecture as critique. In other words, using architecture almost more as a way to speculate about a potential future by critiquing something through your work. And then the second one is architecture as product. And this is inherently, um, if you will, a kind of critique, critique of the traditional kind of owner builder architect model. And this is the idea of an architect or an architecture practice trying to understand a different way to provide uh, services uh, to end users. Well, before I move on, I think it's really important to notice that this traditional idea of owner, architect and builder is far too uh, simplify. Really, when we're talking about owner, are we talking about client? Are we talking about stakeholders? Uh, and of those stakeholders, are they end users? Are there financers involved? So, you know, in many cases, the owner, if you will, if it's a developer, um, and sometimes the developer will operate in an institutional setting. In the case of the University of British Columbia, we're doing a project there, a new art student center. And our client, UBC Properties Trust, is a developer that develops the project on behalf of the university with the student group as a series of stakeholders. Um, on the other hand, in the sphere over here, uh, sphere over here, I just realized you can't see my mouse, um, the uh, builder is really now more of a construction manager and the trades are involved and there's a complex series of forces that operate on that side. In the architect side, well, we have subconsultants, we have authorities having jurisdiction. And what you start to realize is that these kind of simple, simplistic ideas of, of groups that are you know, involved in the production of work are actually much more complicated and represent a series of fields, if you will, that you know, create uh, interference and synergy um, and then you throw in a whole bunch of uh, environmental factors, um, such as social media, research grants, marketing, sponsorship, crowdfunding. And what you actually find is that this is very quickly a kind of overwhelming field um, within which the architect must operate. So um, to go into the kind of case studies, the first case study, which I'm really sort of talking about here is the freedom to speculate, is the traditional architect as developer model. And here I'm gonna be talking about a rental housing prototype that we're working on in Vancouver. Second case study is really a thought experiment. So it's architecture as critique. And it's um, uh, an installation that we did at IDS Vancouver in 2018 uh, called Untitled 392 Sheets of 392 Sheets of Plywood. Uh, case study three, which uh, termed Make Believe, uh, which is a little bit of a play on words, is really the idea of architecture as product uh, and this is a sort of passion project of mine um, that I, a company that I founded with a business partner and it's called the Backcountry Hut Company. 
and it's about the creation of agency um, throughout the architectural process or the construction process. Um, so case study one, freedom to speculate, architect as developer. Uh, this is our uh, prototype, uh, self-initiated prototype, that is a response to the city of Vancouver's modern income rental housing pilot program. And really this was an initiative that came out that was voted through council after 18 months of uh, consultation, which was policy to understand spot rezonings to increase density along major arterial uh, nodes or networks throughout the city of Vancouver. So this was very interesting. And we had, although I had a team of architects with experience in this field, we had none of this multifamily work in our portfolio. And so we saw this opportunity that the city was putting out a call for proposals, um, for inquiries, for sites. And we found a site um, in South Vancouver. And we started with the question of, well, if we took four single family lots, and this was really what the policy was geared towards, or one of the things that the policy was geared towards, and we um, speculated on how we might uh, increase the density from four units to 130 units. And rather than find a developer, uh, or at that time, there were no developers that were approaching us, we really just took it on ourselves to speculate about what might happen on this site. So we took the standard idea of a kind of massing we really decided that we were gonna work with a courtyard scheme as we analyzed the site. Um, we then worked within the context to create uh, a work of art architecture that we felt was responsive to what was happening in the neighborhood. So the advantages of our courtyard scheme as a form of speculation, and the reason we elected to go down this road was that we felt we would be free to imagine a future for modern income rental housing that would lead us to something other than the single standard double loaded corridor. And in the courtyard scheme, we felt that there were a number of advantages, cross ventilation, access to daylight, access to daylight on the inboard side. And the city's policy was affording inboard bedrooms, which is something that we um, strongly felt was, was inappropriate, windowless bedrooms in condos. Uh, it would also facilitate a kind of communal outdoor green space. Um, and it would allow us a kind of unit layout and configuration flexibility. And really we were envisioning a sort of community courtyard space that would be, um, you know, uh, a, a place where families could grow um, and, you know, many different types of, of citizens could, uh, could live and, and, and thrive. So in order to make this scheme viable, we realized that we were responsible for this kind of economic approach and we would develop a scheme, take it ultimately uh, and raise funds and move it forward. Um, so we developed a very pragmatic approach to a series of standardized building blocks, uh, studios, one bedroom units, two bedroom units and three bedroom units that fit almost like a kind of Tetris puzzle into this relatively dumb, simple, ultimately highly standardized uh, structure that was gonna allow us to create a cohesive exterior expression for the work um, in, in a process that was largely driven by the inside out. Uh, and in fact, the project was enormously successful with the city, so, so, so much so that they asked us to increase the scope of our project from four lots to eight lots and at that point, it evolved into a $60 million project and we were instantly overwhelmed. So we're currently in the process of rethinking our approach and actually partnering with the developer um, because quite, quite honestly, this is, this is simply out far outside of our, our kind of area of, uh, of expertise and, and a little too much for us to handle at the moment. The second project that I'm gonna talk about is thought experiment, architecture as critique. And this was our design for the central bar uh, at IDS Vancouver. The central bar is really uh, a place where people in um, the trade show can come and relax. And any of you who've been to IDS Toronto um, will know that it's a very hectic trade show. Um, oh, I can hear myself. There we go. Is, is the audio breaking down again? Yikes. Yikes. 
Can you guys hear me or should I sign out and sign back in? We can hear you. It is, it is breaking down a bit though. We could, right, well, you stop Pardon? we could have you stop streaming your video, like to turn off your camera and see if that helps. Okay. Since we're just, you know, sharing the screen. Let me try that. Is that better? You have to talk a bit more. Okay. <laughs> okay, so in this experiment, uh, the proposition was, the organizers of, of the design show came to us and said, we'd love you to design the central bar. Uh, here's the project brief. You have this much space. It's 24 by 60 feet. Uh, the good news is it'll be a great showcase for your practice. The bad news is there's no fee for this project. Oh, and also you will need to pay for its construction uh, uh, in its entirety and its disassembly. You will have 48 hours to build it and you will have uh, essentially eight hours to tear it down. So we use this opportunity um, to actually offer a critique of the waste that went into uh, and goes into uh, traditional trade shows. You know, we see this incredible uh, effort that is mobilized and then, you know, three days later, the whole thing is torn down and a bunch of it goes into the landfill. So we started with a question of what if we could, as architects, create a spatial installation that worked with a relatively humble material and would um, modulate the experience of the people at the trade show and then also, um, at the end of it, be dismantleable and go back into the stream of, of um, the construction process. So. In this, in order to make this project viable, we actually found a, a plywood sponsor um, and we took 392 sheets of plywood. We started with a very simple sketch to create a spatial matrix and we harnessed the power of the studio to actually build this in 24, uh, 48 hours, actually I think it was 36 hours when it was all said and done in the space of the trade show. And it ended up looking like this. And really what it was, was a spatial device that on the one hand was are very architectural, working with a very simplistic material, somewhat enigmatic, um, looked very different from the exterior than it did from the interior, and really created an opportunity to kind of modulate, um, you know, the spatial experience inside and outside the show. Um, I want to quickly move through my last case study, which is architecture as product. I realize we're kind of up on the, the time limit here and I will move through this one very quickly. Case study three, make believe. Um, this project was really a kind of speculative idea that started with a fundamental question of how can we empower users, user groups and individuals to understand the creation of small scale architecture in a relatively unskilled way. You know, we use this diagram and it's kind of a blessing and a curse. It explains the concept, but unfortunately it confounds our idea of creating, you know, materially rich, I would say high quality enduring architecture with, you know, the disposable notion um, uh, or notion of disposability uh, that Ikea has come to be known with. However, the approach, the idea that you could create a systematic kit of parts that would be delivered to people and it would allow these users to construct these buildings in any location, remote locations at the far extreme or urban locations or rural locations to create um, meaningful architecture was really the goal here. So we developed a series of systems. The first system was a two-story system intended to be installed in very remote locations, intended to be helicoptered in. And this really was our first field build, our first prototype. We then developed a second system, um, which was a single story system, a little more modest, a little easier to build. Um, and this system was our second prototype. And actually we launched this second system at IDS Toronto and we entirely self-funded this build. This is a, a shot of the interior. We called this one, the Great Lakes Cabin. Um, and at the, you know, we, we imagined it going into a, a place in rural Northern Ontario. And this was the initial conceptual rendering. This was the product installed in the trade show. 
And actually, we were very fortunate because we had a entrepreneurial client who saw it at the trade show and bought it. And this is coming up on the final installation on his island in, in Georgian Bay. Um, subsequently, we developed a much smaller scale system because we realized the cost of these larger systems was becoming very prohibitive. So this is our, our third system, our smallest system, which is under 108 square feet, can be built without a permit and provides very small scale shelter um, for people in, in rural environments. We call this the, the Arrowhead A-frame or System Zero. And we prototype this system ourselves, um, again, in a remote um, island in Ontario. Uh, and it really was an experiment in you know, design, build, production, self-assembly of architecture. And we've just finished um, these prototypes and are now launching these products into the marketplace. So with these systems, we're speculating on you know, uh, a virtually unlimited series of possibilities, you know, from laneway houses, infill, um, remote destinations, um, rural locations, and we're, we're looking to provide agency for people to have a more direct hand in their built environment. So I'll leave it at that. Um, hopefully, uh, through this talk, I've really been able to um, explain how our practice is working at the intersection of owner, builder, architect uh, to, to actually create opportunities to practice our craft, contribute, and to question the way things typically happen uh, in the built environment. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I just really appreciate the kind of clarity that you've outlaid uh, these different models uh, for us and the diversity and scope of your work. Um, I want to be sensitive to time, but also um, I want to, so I want to acknowledge that we will get to a moderated discussion and we will allow for open Q and A. Um, but uh, John, John Van Nostrand, if, if you, um, just in, I know that earlier, unfortunately your audio cut out, but I think we would all still like very much to hear about uh, even if briefly um, what you're working with that parcel. Um, I think, we, we had heard a little bit about how you were revisiting the structure, going from shear wall construction to something else. And I was wondering if you can maybe pick that up for us and, and sort of tell us a bit about how that differs from maybe a, a more conventional market approach. Yeah, um, well, I would say, uh, as I say, the, the, the two developments, we were actually working on three developments. Um, the one, the first one, um, is an eight-story building. As I say, what, what we're doing is creating it on a column and slab basis, so limiting the interior structure. We subdivide the plate into lots or parcels, if you want to call them that, that are 250 square feet each. Uh, well, maybe 300 in the, in the next one, but 250 in the first. People can then actually purchase uh, whatever combination of lots, one, two, three, the, 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 and, and they're in two, you can purchase them in two forms. One is, as I said earlier, basic, which is they're, ba they're legally habitable. They have bathroom and a kitchen and basic finishes, and then you can take them from there or, and, and finish them yourselves or pay 15% more for a fully finished unit. Um, turnkey, what we call turnkey. We also are, I've been really interested in the idea of being able to facilitate subletting of housing of, of to, to, to lead. We believe there's a strong relationship between owning and renting. Um, in fact, and that was indicated in the early, the pre 1950 period where something like 35 to 45% of people built their own house. It actually wasn't building their own house. It was actually managing construction of their house. In fact, we've worked in a lot of large squatter areas or illegal areas in, in, uh, in country, other countries in the world. So developing areas where local governments or, or ever, you know, independence has happened. And the first problem they have is 85% of people are living illegally as a result of the planning regime they came into. So it's, it's, and we've developed a kind of incremental approach to that, but, um, so that, that 
simple idea we've been marketing to people uh, in, a, in, a, in a neighborhood. So that's another thing is we actually spend a lot of time in the neighborhood itself learning to understand what, what the economics are. So for example, we found out that the average rent in the income in the rent that people are paying in the neighborhood we're working in with our first project is $1,200. Well, $1,200 for the same figure, you could finance a, a mortgage of twenty-two, dollars $225,000 plus or minus. So then the problem becomes a, the uh, down payment and we worked out a kind of financial idea around how we put that down payment together. So then people are result end up paying the same amount they are for renting, but to own. So that actually that smallest unit, the 250 unit that is um, uh, basic is affordable to people earning in Hamilton, at least a, a, a living wage of about 25 to $30,000. So then one can go for there. And, that, and the, the idea here is, is not to just be fancy. It's actually about if, if life is always changing, why isn't the architecture? Not that we change it for people. We actually, it's, they, they have the opportunity to change things over. So, so what we've already found out is that, for instance, older couples who are, who are downsizing are interested in having that fully finished one bedroom. So that's two units, two, two lots. And they want to move in. They don't want to deal with all the... But a younger person for the in the same income bracket will actually buy one finished lot and two, one basic lot, sorry, one, two basic lots and one uh, turnkey lot. They rent out the turnkey lot and the income from that allows them to fix up their unit when they get to the point of, let's just say, having a child, if that's the big event, or taking in an elder, they can then take over that, the third unit um, and, uh, and enlarge their thing. And then also, you know, downsize later on by, by renting it back out or actually selling it. Um, so you can sell these combinations. So it's, it's really just, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, as I say, the tower model has always been sort of predetermined and we're trying to break out of that and say, well, what, what would happen if, you know, uh, people could actually make a decision and what you find, so 40, 35 to 40% of people building their own homes, but 90% of them have a, a border or larger border or larger so that they're using the rental to pay off the, uh, the, the ownership um, and living in it at the same time, of course. So I think in Canada, we got ourselves into a jam where it's sort of, if you own, you're rich and if you're poor, you rent. And, and all, our, so all the financing for the 65% that comes from government is to do with rental. And I think that's a bit of a problem, uh, is not a long-term solution and we cannot possibly subsidize it, which is why it's been very slow coming into being. Uh, you just, it's huge and huge amounts of money that, that are actually, it, it's that money that's being spent out there already that could be spent productively. If I go back to the 40% and more, I mean, that, uh, that, that could be channeled here. And that in itself gets back to economy because Downstairs in the, in, the, in the lobby is a list of the local trades that you can hire to help you finish your unit or, or make the changes you need or whatever. So that you're, you're actually, I think housing is our biggest economy. That's, that's the big link here. I mean, the Dutch about six, well, eight years ago, created a law that said if you, you're entitled to own a home uh, if you're 18 years and older, and we all thought, or I certainly thought that's ridiculous. Like, how, how, you know, I, I knew you were a socialist. I'm, I've got a bit of a Dutch background, so I'm allowed to say this. You know, I knew you were socialist, but how the hell can you do this? And they said, well, um, actually we, we went on a hunch and the hunch has turned out to be correct. And, it, and the hunch was that housing themselves has become Holland's largest economy quite simply. Uh, but it's also changed the way, so you'll get new communities which are actually pre-designed uh, volumetrically and, and, but, and then reduced to a subdivision. But the subdivision is based on the smallest lots you think, this is the 
looking forward, if you want to call it speculation, I don't think it's speculation in our case, it's what, what it's documentation of history and how we got here and all those studies we did of lots and densification of lots. And, um, so you, you, you can buy a, a lot for three car garage and a big home, or you can buy you know, two lots that have a, for an apartment building, according for eight of you who want to share one or a huge variety. And you have a list of architects and a list of builders you can go to if you need their help. So you actually work on the design and, 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 and that, that, that's a, been a very popular form of, of development there and uh, lots to learn from it, I think. Um, and I think it goes, you know, just to talk about heritage here like a bit, it, you have to go back to John Habrocken, uh, who was a Dutch person who wrote about marge, you know, the housing quite a bit, taught housing. Um, and I'd say you have to go back to Le Corbusier because I think it's interesting I think it's interesting in the end that the pavilion he built for himself was really a concrete floor, concrete stair and a concrete roof. And underneath everything else was cubic and could be changed and altered. But, and he even drew at the time he drew it as a ruin. Like in the long term, you just see a stair, a roof and a, uh, a floor. And that's a really interesting concept because I think that's to do with the structure, the immutable structure, which is us and what, what we think locally and what is, what will remain forever, but what is changing. And we, we make buildings that balance that out. <clears throat> so that sort of, I'll just say one last thing. So the, the, we're working on a modular, with, with a modular system, sort of based around the Vancouver model, the original Vancouver model of part, you know, uh, temporary transitional housing, which I'm sure Michael knows about, except that we, the only difference is that we, we see it it's being able to be permanent. So it's housing that can be built on sites. You know, it takes, we'll, we'll be building on a, one of our sites because it's going to take four years before we actually get to construction. So you build it, it's with you steel modules um, that can, can serve as uh, uh, for uh, shelter beds, like really basic shelter um, or be one bedroom units and can be transformed, combined to make uh, um, a variety, accommodate a variety of forms of home uh, of accommodation over time. Um, so I think that what's the important debate that's out there about modular is, is, is it, it sort of between, is it one size fits all or is it what I think it is, which is that it allows for much more diversity and variety and uh, tenure uh, changes, you know. I'll just say the last word, <laughs> last comment, just historically, between 1970 and 1990, the most new housing in Ontario was created through resubdivision of old subdivisions. So it's a very, a very popular. I mean, it, it's it, it's a yeah. You know, it's a, I think there's a lesson to learn there. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Um, it's very. There's a lot, a lot of uh, food for thought there, and uh, appreciate being able to hear about your work. Um, I guess as a, as a starting question for both uh, Michael and, and John, um, in your talks, you sort of touch on a series of um, sort of allied disciplines to, to architecture, including planning and construction and, and economics. And, um, and obviously there's a body of, of wealth of information that you've accumulated from sort of decades, if I may, <laughs> decades of experience. Um, and just kind of looking around the room, you have uh, what are mostly sort of students, some graduates, some alumni, but, um, and who have gone through an architectural education. Uh, I wonder if, if you, uh, Michael and John, if you're looking back on the sort of different ventures you've started and the different fields that you've had to sort of either branch out to or find allies in, um, what sort of value would you say a kind of conventional education architectural education has and do you think it it becomes not just optional but necessary for sort of young practitioners to acquire a, a, a different kind of a diversified education if you will in either business or perhaps in, in construction um, or do you think that this is something that is still best sort of learned on the job to be able to really engage with the complexity of, of all the issues that, that um, you've highlighted in your talks today. John, would you like to start or would you like me to, to tackle that first? Go ahead, Michael. 
Okay. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I think if we're talking about the value of architectural education here, uh, you know, there, there's an ongoing debate, which is, you know, what should be taught in school? What is learned, you know, in the field or in professional practice through a kind of apprenticeship, if you will. And one of the real challenges is that that architecture is such a broad field. I mean, I, you know, I graduated uh, with my master's in 2003. So I've been, you know, practicing now for, for 17 years and, and 10 years of independent practice. And, you know, I wake up every day and am just kind of continually learning. And I think things like this, you know, listening to John talk about his experience and the way that he's tackling, um, you know, the, the kind of issue of housing, I find kind of incredibly inspiring. And one of the things that uh, is so important is perspective. And perspective is very difficult to teach in a classroom setting. It comes through mentorship, it comes through culture and a kind of, let's call it a kind of body of knowledge that exists in a field, in an entire discipline, um, you know, through the ways that the discipline is practiced and documented. And so I really feel that, you know, if we're going to call it traditional architectural education, and it's, it's, it's going to sound discouraging, but is really just like the first couple percent of becoming, uh, you know, uh, an architect uh, or engaging in the field of architecture. And one of the most discouraging things, you know, that, that, you know, my experience working with interns and mentoring interns through the process to become registered architects is they constantly feel that they hit a milestone, you know, a plateau and they go back down to the, to the bottom of the food chain again. So you graduate and then you're an intern. You know, you become registered and then you still know nothing. And, you know, you're constantly kind of growing. And, and I think rather than be discouraged by that idea, be inspired by the fact that as you learn more, you realize how little you actually know. And, you know, I will say that, uh, you know, listening to, to John talk, uh, you know, there's a fundamental question here about the structure of the city as really just a structure of oppression and capitalism. You know, if you talk about these ideas of utopian ideals, you know, worker cities, like, is that the fundamental model that everything that we see in terms of, you know, the kind of uh, mega city is based on? And should we be fundamentally questioning that? You know, what I, what I find here in Vancouver, and it's the same in Toronto, one of the single biggest barriers is, you know, the cost of real estate. So, you know, the cost of an average single family lot in Vancouver is, is over $1.4 million. And so the only way you're actually gonna get away from a rental tower model, which is problematic because it's taking government funding, it's taking everybody's means and funneling it upwards, right? Into a traditional power pyramid paradigm. If you're trying to facilitate land ownership, I see that there are only two ways forward. The first is to break down the increment of the city so that you don't need to work within the traditional urban framework of a single family lot. You could, you could half it, you could quarter it, you know, and, and understand that a quarter lot is actually what, what somebody might be able to afford. Or you break down the structure of living in the city altogether and you say, you know what, now this COVID crisis has really taught us that the centralized model that we've assumed is, you know, over the last, 20, 30 years, 100 years is really the way for humans to live is actually not the way for us to live. It is just reinforcing this kind of, you know, hierarchical imbalance in wealth. And it's really an artifact of an old system. Anyway, I, I went on a bit of a tangent there. So, uh, but I, I really was inspired um, by what, what John was saying and, and the work that Parcel is doing to kind of, you know, consider uh, a more democratic distribution of wealth, but access to housing. And, you know, listening, John, to you talk about this idea of, you know, you have a small parcel of land, you have a, a list of architects and builders that you can work with, and, and, you know, you start with something, you know, really reminded me on the one hand of, of the incomplete architecture of uh, Aravena, the work that he's done in Chile, you know, that allow people just to have that, that little bit of a foothold in the market and then go from there on the one hand, 
But it also reminds me of the CMHC housing program, which really saw, you know, the proliferation in a very democratic way of the Canadian rural landscape, you know, in the 1950s, 1960s, 70s, and into the 80s, where you could buy sets of plans for $10. And the CMHC would fund and connect you with the builder, finance your property, and you could pursue this dream of home ownership. And the one thing that's very interesting about that is that when you travel through Canada, and I think, you know, it's an amazing opportunity in this vast landscape that we have to travel through all these rural areas. What you actually see in the, in the built landscape is the democratization of that process. Because over those three or four decades, what happened systematically was the designs that people built, that essentially people voted for with their dollar, were the designs that were kept in the catalog year after year. And the ones that people weren't building were edited out and there were opportunities for new experimental prototype designs to come into the catalog. Anyway, that's a, a whole other talk that I could go on for hours for, but John, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, really, yeah, you're touching a lot of really interesting topics. And, um, but I would, I would just go back to the education to start with. I, I really put it briefly, but is I think we should go back and learn from the School of Practical Sciences, bringing, bringing these people together into a common uh, school, um, I, I think is, is a key element here. I say this because I actually have, it's been a conscious effort in our practice from day one in the, in the 70s to collaborate, find people to collaborate from other disciplines is to be part of the firm. So engineers for sure, not just structural mechanical, but also municipal engineers, uh, you know, wastewater engineering, um, uh, 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 road engineering, um, to, to sort of build up a multi, a, a multi discipline firm, but one that's working together. I mean, it's fine to have them all in the house, but not good if they're all working separately. So a lot of the bigger, like the WSP sort of AECOM model, they're all there, but they never collaborate with each other. Um, and, and I think there must be a way of, and I think Waterloo sort of edging that way for sure is to, look, I think, I think making a building, the closest thing I can think of is, is it's like making a film. This is really unfortunate. It always cuts off just as he starts. <laughs> right at the key moment. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Maybe it's a way of building suspense. <laughs> We'll wait for John to, to join us again shortly, I'm sure. You know, while we're waiting for John, one of the things that, you know, that, that I will maybe offer is that I think the idea of multidisciplinary practice is, is, uh, is very, very important. And at the same time, as you bring everyone together, you know, people and groups and, and you know, collaborators need to come together with their independent viewpoints and level of expertise. And then there needs to be a, an inclusive you know, dialogue where everybody can, can offer a different view. And, and in many ways, the role of the architect is to you know, understand and balance you know, those, those kind of disparate um, viewpoints. And so it's a, it's a very kind of integrative process. Um, and you know, I, I think that um, one of the single biggest challenges that we face as architects is not a lack of vision. It's a challenge of dealing with the blunt tools of policy, which are incredibly slow, um, you know, to kind of adapt and be responsive. And that's one of the single biggest challenges that we face when we're trying to be innovative. Do you imagine that there's some combination then of a sort of planning and architecture as, as not sort of an exclusive thing, but maybe as a sort of, uh, a new future model that that is just sort of the way going forward that there needs to be sort of in-house expertise and, and be able to negotiate with and and uh, have a conversation with those authorities as part of the architectural practice. I think it's, it, you know, if, if you're going to practice on a kind of urban scale and you're going to engage work that is meaningful, you need to have a certain amount of understanding and, and you know, 
the idea of the architect singular is, is a kind of myth. It's a Promethean myth. It doesn't exist. You know, the architect is always a group of people. And the more inclusive you can make that voice, the more multivalent, the more viewpoints you can bring to the discussion, the richer, you know, the kind of process and, and, uh, and, the, will, and the work um, will be. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's not an easy process. Um, and, it, and it's, you know, a, a process that really involves a, a very high degree of negotiation. I think that emotional intelligence is an, an absolute prerequisite uh, you know, for a kind of successful career in architecture. And, and these are skills in addition to, you know, an understanding of finance and, you know, macro and microeconomics that aren't necessarily part of a kind of core traditional architecture program, but, you know, are things that, you know, people learn in life. And I think through, through appropriate mentorship. Oh, that's a really good point, Michael. And I, and I appreciate that you stressed the, the sort of importance of the sort of mentorship and, and um, in some ways, we're very, very glad that this event can happen. And, and if we can only kind of hear from you briefly, that still, I think, is an important contribution. Um, I think what we'll do right now, because we're still waiting for John McNostrand to sort of rejoin us, is we'll start to take open Q&A. So the way we'll do this is if you could just type your question in the chat, and we're going to try to get to it in order of priority. Um, and... Uh, when John Minostrin kind of joins us again, we will kind of reconvene his uh, his talk earlier. So if anyone has questions, just feel free to type them in the chat and we'll try to address them in order that we see them. While we're waiting for questions, one of the things that I might say to fill the silence is, you know, part of the reason why I'm uh, personally and, and also my practice is you know, concerned with the idea of speculation is that we're in a position where we have practitioners, you know, whose work was rooted in the 70s, where there was an enormous amount of social responsibility uh, and kind of vision, um, you know, kind of utopian and idealistic vision. And one of my biggest concerns, you know, is that in the last, you know, geez, I guess we're talking 50 years since then, you know, that, that kind of climate for the production of work in architecture culture has become increasingly driven by capitalism and capital. And so what we really need to understand as architects is that, you know, if we cannot solve these problems, if we cannot offer solutions or discourse or really, you know, kind of stand for, you know, the kind of future world that, you know, that, that, you know, might be a, you know, represent the ideals of our country, um, you know, who will do this? And so as architects, it's important to be hopeful. It's important to speculate. It's important to imagine the, you know, the kind of future that, that represents and embodies the kind of ideals of, of the places that we practice. I'll jump in here for a second. Um, and I'm going to um, see if I can share a screen because I wanted to, I've, I've had a conversation with some of the students um, in light of, of this, uh, the planning of this symposium. Um, so I'm just gonna give it a try here. So, um, you know, I, I was reflecting on the, the kind of, you, you talked about speculation, Michael, and, and, um, and um, you know, part of that is kind of having a skin in the game and, and, and the kind of the values that, that one can bring to that and, and the role of agency that one can have. And, and in thinking about the city of Toronto and, and it's the same, even in a more extreme way in Vancouver as the, as the real estate values have increased, the kind of the decrease in agency that, that young architects have is, has been really notable, right? Um, and so I'm just gonna try and see if I can do an annotation thing here for a second. So, for example, in the you know, if you were if you were graduating in the '70s, you know, there were there were lots of lots of young architects who uh, built um, places that may be bounded by. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, uh, you know, in the kind of in sort of a, in, in the core of the city area, you know, and then in the '80s, it was kind of more well, people started to kind of do have areas out here, you know, and in the 90s, it started to be kind of people kind of graduating and, and kind of buying properties and building out here. And then, and then who knows in the, in the kind of tens and the, and the current, I mean, it's really, uh, there, 
somewhere out here, somewhere out here, you know, and it changes the, the, the way that the architects, young architects relationship to the city. And so I think it's, it's fascinating to look at uh, the role in the way in which sort of the first house that architects buy and then, and then in some cases where they, they start to, um, you know, uh, accumulate additional property and begin to and, and some of them getting into kind of development and getting into that kind of role that you talk about Michael in terms of uh, being able to kind of engage and speculate um, as a as a kind of stakeholder in the field um, which puts them in a very different position and there's a number of number of architects in uh, graduated from our program that have that have done that um, and uh, and a few I mean the example that I mentioned of Majer Mordazavi, um, who you know had had some some background to work with in terms of his parents' work, but but others who have, who have kind of built up that agency. And I think it's interesting to to think about the, the thing that you just mentioned about um, the the question of of uh, what dominates the intentions uh, of a of an architect and, and a practice in terms of whether the idea is. Um, simply the accumula accumulation of capital or whether it's actually to kind of transform uh, conditions in, in the urban environment. And uh, over the weekend, I was, I was, uh, I, I cycle and I, I was cycling around looking at and thinking about where some of these places are. And, and in a sense that what I was struck by was there's a cumulative role um, that architects play in terms of their neighborhoods and the way that they contribute, you know, and, and, and I think that's a hopeful sign uh, in the sense that regardless of, of the time, and it gets more and more difficult as property values increase and, and people are excluded. But, you know, the idea of the dividing properties of, of, of sharing and, and building up a base, I think is part of that role that, um, that is continued to be played. And, and in some cases, you know, um, there was a movement uh, a decade or so ago as people started to get priced out of Toronto that they started to move into Hamilton and to other, other communities and so on. And so the idea that that, that influence that architects uh, kind of on mass can have not just through the work in their practices, but through their own particular and, and personal engagement with um, with kind of improvement in neighborhood conditions is something that I think is uh, it hasn't really been talked about a lot, but it's something that's really valuable in terms of of, uh, of a role that architecture and architects can play uh, in their communities. Thanks for pointing that out, John. Um, and I know we had we've had these discussions earlier as an organizing team, and I appreciate that you brought that up again. <laughs> Um, I want to start going through the questions here, and I'm going to go a little bit out of order. Um, just be, I, I guess just as a public uh, now statement, if you could post your questions in the public chat, that way um, that everyone can see them. Um, there's no need to kind of send them uh, individually. Uh, so I'll actually start with the first one that I received. This is from Alex Robinson, um, and you can see it in the chat here. It's a question from Michael. Uh, how can your firm work with the city for pushing more social slash cultural policies? Is it through reports, integration of built presidents into city policy? Um, great question. You know, uh, policy is a top down structure. Uh, and it is, it is, you know, a series of blunt tools, very slow, very cumbersome, um, an administrative heavy process. The entire series of strategies and tactics that my practice uses are actually bottom up tactics. Um, and, and, you know, by looking at policies, by understanding the framework in a very in depth and detailed way in which we operate, we actually find the opportunities to do things. And so, you know, the moderate income rental housing pilot program that I was talking about is more of a reactive, um, kind of response than anything else. It's, you know, excuse me, as a group of architects looking at city policy and paying attention to what's happening and, you know, being focused and wanting to create impact in affordable housing, we see the policy that the city comes out with and then we engage the city directly um, in this manner. And I should say what's really important to understand is, you know, this is more than just you know, speculating on a piece of property, what I ended up doing was I raised uh, enough capital through colleagues um, and in my network to actually purchase one of those properties. So of the four properties that were in the original um, parcel, the idea was to purchase 
uh, and, and hold one of those properties um, so that that would be the kind of keystone for us to then contemplate a land assembly and move forward. And it was actually only because we were holding title of one of those properties um, that uh, allowed us to engage in this meaningful conversation with the city. And I will say from, you know, the architectural point of view, for me to engage this project, what I essentially did is created a corporate structure where you know each of the partners invested a certain amount of income and i looked at the project proposal and said okay this is you know this is a, a loosely speaking pro forma to proceed with a project you know um and you know this is the value of kind of architectural services and that was essentially a sweat equity equity share in the property that you know was balanced against um you know, hard cash that other investors were putting in and collectively we purchased the property and then started to, um, you know, started to, to kind of create and craft that proposal. And so it's, it's a different approach. Again, it's an emergent approach. I mean, you know, in all of these, um, you know, structures, you're really trying to serve the needs of a client, a stakeholder, an end user. And, in the work that we're trying to do, whether it's the backcountry hut company or these self-initiated development projects, we're actually trying to connect more purely with the end user rather than the layers of structure that exist in between. So if you're working directly for a developer, the developer will largely dictate the structure and form of development based on their experience with pro forma. Um, and, it, and it takes so much of the kind of visioning process out of that. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm going to, uh, John Munoz, can you hear us? Okay, we see that you, you've joined us again. Actually, a question for you. Uh, this is from Felix Yang. Um, I'm curious to hear what your point of view is on long-term rental models for housing. Are there models either city run or private that you see working well? That's a hard question to answer. I think they're getting better, but, but I, I think we just have to, the key of what I'm saying is that everything we do is going to change. We have to plan for that and design for that. And, and, and so the rental, I, we're going to do some rental, but it can become ownership. If, you know, we, we no prob, we're working with the ownership as a start, but we're working, one of our buildings will be rental, but it can be to sort of flip to say, well, how can you start out as a renter and end, end up owning, which is also something that was very normal uh, for, 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 for instance, for, for, for anybody immigrating to Canada, that was a normal way of starting and then and ending, ending up owning. So I, I, I just, I can't get over, because of the economics of owning and the double economics of owning and renting, I, I can't sort of break out of that to just say, well, one or the other is the answer, uh, at least for the 65%. Um, that we're, we're trying to address. Um, ex I, I don't know, I mean, I, I, it must be specific, specific examples of renting that are good. Um, I, I just, I, I don't know them right now. You know. Thanks, John. Um, next, I, I just wanted to end up what I was saying, Sorry. if I may, just earlier, I, I was getting to the fact that School, a school where which integrates the, the prime disciplines, the, the, the pragmatic sci arts and sciences, if we want to call it that, um, is one as an office. What I can tell you is it leads to all kinds of a much broader stream of work. Uh, for instance, we we designed, we planned and designed and laid out an entire town for ninety thousand people at one end of the spectrum and building single family homes at the other um, and everything in between. We, we've, on the infrastructure side, we're now act really strongly involved in working with, with the province to directly in fact on the transit lines, which are, and, and what's the influence of transit on its surroundings and the displacement of people and how do you eliminate displacement? And how the corridors are really needed by that 65%, but they're being, Bought up by people who are only going to build the 35, those kind of issues. Uh, streets like St. George Street in Toronto, 
Uh, we had a whole project on sanitation, on inventing a toilet, uh, which we did, that has been used extensively uh, in, in a very affordable toilet that we spent, worked on for, for three or four years. It's been uh, expanded now across most of Africa. Um, these, these are the right, and I'm not just saying this to show off, I'm just saying, hey, it's a body of work. And I don't know if it's architecture or not. It, it, like the OAA, actually, when I went to join, said that building toilets was not architecture. <laughs> but I, I, took, I went to them with a lawyer and said, well, yes, it is, actually. And we, we won, and I could qualify because I was working under somebody who was already an architect. So I, I just think there's a, uh, it's, it's the brain that we you learn. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to learn that kind of a brain where you're just learning about architecture. It becomes, you know, in many ways, the architects in my office are the most difficult people to deal with because they think they know everything, being quite frank. You know, they want, they, what do we need the planners for? What do we need these people for? So it's a, it's a kind of irony. And I'm not saying that with any, you know, malice, malice or disrespect, but it's true that it, it, it's a, so, so it's, it's, how do you work in teams? And how do you work effectively in teams? And how do you bring your, and how can you combine that? And with all the tools we have, I think it's much easier, much more easily done now than it could before. And I think it would, I think we are talking about a radical change from the 1945 model, which we're still living in. We're still a very successful colony in many respects. Um, um, so we're so successful, we don't even know our own history and how it worked and what, you know, how did it, how do we get to where we are? But um, there's a lot to learn there. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we can kind of finish here, hear the rest of that thought. Um, so continuing with the questions and to everyone asking these, I apologize. I'm getting them in very different orders, maybe than what everyone else sees, but um, a question from Vincent. So this is a question from Michael. Can you talk about uh, the collaboration between the developer and architect, which occurred after the support and interest in the courtyard residential project? Also in the project, many more humanizing and livability concerns were taken in the scheme. Did that impact the overall price per square foot of the project? Yeah, so this is a, a really interesting question. So, um, you know, it, it's worth noting that speculative development in the city uh, is a tenuous endeavor, you know? And on the one hand, we have urban policy that has been supported by research, by planning, voted in by council, uh, and, and this proposal fits in that. And then you actually have neighborhoods who are opposed to any form of development in their neighborhood. And so one of the things that is interesting is this project is kind of stuck in the tension, you know, between these, you know, really two forces, this kind of top down force of planning and this bottom up force. And, you know, it would be all too simple to sort of suggest that, you know, this is a kind of nimbious backlash, um, that people in Vancouver love density as long as it's not in their backyard. That, that's great, let's do density there or there, but not where I live. Um, it's a little more complex than that. And I think, um, you know, it, it, it's not kind of without, um, without sort of conflict. And in fact, when we first were looking at this project, we thought at the smaller scale, we thought we might be able to self-finance it. And then as it grew to, you know, uh, an eight lot uh, scheme at, you know, close to 300 units, we realized there was no way that we would be able to raise the capital and engage in this project. And so we went out to try to find uh, a development partner. We were interviewing development partners and we were very strategic about the people that we talked to. And, you know, initially the um, response that we were getting was, you know, guys, we love this proposal, but it's simply the bottom line is not profitable enough for us to be involved. And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you are only comparing models against what I would say is the lowest common denominator, double loaded corridor, stacked tower scheme, you are always going to come up against this idea that, oh, well, you know, why would we do this scheme when we could do that scheme over there? And so, again, this probably comes back down to a policy question, you know, that starts to challenge 
the livability of, of you know, these models. And Vancouver is a tower city. Um, so we are kind of swimming upstream in this, in this instance. And, uh, you know, it, I think that the answer really is going to lie in policy to start to drive what the baseline fundamental expectations are for urban form. Thanks, Michael. Um, the next question, and I just want to reiterate to everyone who's asked a question so far, um, thank you for, for all your questions. I have three queued up, and if, if our speakers could bear with us, it will go a little bit over 12, but I think we can try to get through these three. Um, the next question comes from Eduardo Souza, um, who asks, teaching this economic pragmatism to architecture students could lead to unwanted consequences, such as less creative thinking. Should a student be, by definition, have a more uh, broad horizon? I will jump all over that question because I actually think that understanding the pragmatism of the natural world is an inherent necessity in architectural practice and in architectural discourse. The single biggest challenge that the profession has, in my opinion, is that for far too long now it's retreated from the idea of kind of everyday pragmatism and isolated itself in a kind of ivory tower. And sure, we can talk about these landmark projects, these signature projects, but we also then have to understand that less than 2% of the built environment globally actually happens with the involvements of architect, uh, with an architect or architects. And so if we're unwilling to embrace the everyday and engage in the kind of messy business of pragmatism, we're really just going to marginalize our own professional impact and, and presence, not just locally, but, but globally. Um, and then secondly, when it comes to creative thinking, I think what we're all talking about here, myself, John, you know, um, is, is really this idea that it's not enough to design creatively, you have to be creative in every single mode of practice. You have to be creative in the way you're thinking about project delivery, in the way that you're understanding how to engage stakeholders, in the way that you're scrutinizing the way that things have already been, always been done, and whether or not that is the way they should be done moving forward. I just maybe would add that I, I'm not sure what Eduardo means by economic pragmatism, but he means if he's saying something about the, the bottom line is in this argument that the dollar is challenging the architecture, I just say, well, he's wrong. Um, the, the challenge is to understand the unwanted consequences from the beginning and to address them head on. Because I, I think what we, we've, tried, we've tried to oversimplify everything for so long that we have, we've forgotten that, uh, you know, I often, I, my, my, one of my favorite, just briefly stories is, is, is Le Corbusier builds Le P Pesac. You know, I don't know if you've ever read any of your Pesac Revisited, but Pesac was his first sort of modernist housing project in Bordeaux. A, a sociologist shows up uh, 20 years later and looks at it and sees people have changed all the houses and put shutters and it's all been sort of screwed up. It's all is messy, in fact. And, um, and so he, he actually goes to Le Corbusier, who's still alive in his office in Paris. A after he studies this for two years, he wrote a book uh, on that called Pesac Revisited. And so he goes to Le Corbusier and he said, do you realize what's going on down there? Have you looked at these photos? And Corb says, you know, come back tomorrow. I gotta, I gotta think about this. He comes back tomorrow and he says, the first thing he says and the only thing he says really is that, you know, it's always life that's right in architecture that's wrong. And I think that's a profound realization uh, 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 for, for all the, you know, he's become the pariah of urbanization and, but, but with, with the sort of tower side of things, but for, for, for thinking, uh, I think he's, I think he's right on. And I think that's a maxim that certainly our practice works with. I think that's a, you know, Pesek is a, is a really interesting example, John, because it's uh it's one of the first, you know, examples of, uh, you know, occupants, inhabitants, users uh, having agency in their own built environment. Uh, and, right. and, you know, while it was kind of deemed a failure in some ways at the beginning, it was exactly that research of revisiting it that 
that really created that epiphany moment. Wait a second. They are actually, you know, they are actually modifying the structures. They are actually having an exercising agency. And, and, uh, and then it was that, that, I think that pivot from a top down way of thinking to a bottom up way of thinking and embracing that, that, that recognized it's kind of latent success. Well, even it was more than that, even that I went to the Fondation Le Corbusier a couple of years ago, we were there in Paris to talk about the Maison Domino and the background to it. And they said, actually the, the, the structure that is column and slab structure was tested in a number of cities after the war. Put up as a structure so people could see what it, what, what it, you know how, what it looked like. But what happened is people started to use the rubble around them to build their house in the structure. It remains undocumented, unfortunately, but apparently there are there are fifty houses like this in in in, in France. That, People just built up a house in the place and still don't realize, it, don't remember the history of it even today. Um, so I think it's really interesting. Um, and I think, I think Maison Suisse, or the center for say, studies in Suisse, is a really interesting product in the end. <clears throat> Thanks, Michael, and, and John as well. Uh, I just want to say that I just want to. I just want to say quickly that we have one very quick, very architectural question about dimensions, and then we have one a final question. I think will be an opportunity for us to make uh, for the speakers to make some uh, last comments. So the very quick uh, dimensional question uh, comes from Victor, who's asking what the dimensions are of your multifamily projects. John, what is the dimension of the 250 square foot and 300 square foot parcel? And Michael, how deep are the units you're proposing for the Vancouver Courtyard uh, project? So, so in our courtyard proposal, I mean, it's interesting. I think when you work down to an essentialist approach, you ultimately sort of come to similar dimensions, I think, that are based around the scale of the body and furniture. So we're working with 3.5 meters center to center between our units. Uh, and then we're working with a, a maximum 10 meter depth. And that 10 meter depth is very challenging unless you're able to provide access to light and ventilation on the inboard side. Thanks, Michael. Um, inevitably in, in a question on architectural symposium, we will get to the nuts and bolts. Um, so one final question and um, Conrad, if I may, I think this is a question for both uh, John and Michael. Um, I'm just gonna get back to it, um, which is, uh, I think both of you obviously are very accomplished and, and have started a variety of different uh, initiatives at, at different points in your career. And I think Conrad is getting at something that we all kind of want to ask, which is, you know, starting off from maybe a place where you're just waiting for the phone to ring, you know, at what point did you reach a sort of self-confidence and willingness to break out on your own? Um, and what are your thoughts on what the sort of required tools and experiences that you need to, to start out? You know, I, I would say, uh, despite the fact that I was saying earlier that it takes decades and decades and decades to develop any sort of competency in, in architecture and you know, I will say, we talk about this in my practice, that one day we hope to do a, a great building. Um, you know, if we, could, if we could produce one, you know, really great work of architecture, it would be a, an enormous accomplishment. Um, everything that we do is kind of trial and error, and we're testing and we're working to the, to the best of our abilities. And, you know, quite arguably, you know, if you're not kind of embarrassed, uh, you know, about the person you were or the work that you were doing two years ago, then you're probably not growing enough. So I think inherent in that discomfort is just understanding the scale and the stakes, you know, at which you're operating and the potential for the magnitude in those failures. Um, so, you know, you can find opportunity at every scale when you're immediately out of school, you know, and I think the trick is, in looking for opportunity to practice the craft of architecture, to have agency, to bring beauty into the world. And, you know, I, I would suggest that, that that is the opportunity and it happens on day one. And 
remember that architecture can exist across a, 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 a huge range of scale. You don't need tons of money uh, to actually produce architecture. And those opportunities exist in the everyday world, whether they're small speculative projects about taking over a urban parking lot to create a small park, um, engaging in a small scale architectural competition. And the key in starting a, a small nascent practice is the idea of having enough diversity that, you know, you can understand that, you know, you, you might have a little bit of revenue that's generated from some projects and some things you do out of passion, but it is in that freedom that not everything comes down to, am I being paid for this? What is the fee for this project? It's actually trying to balance a broader spectrum of, you know, means and needs um, in order to always keep the focus on the opportunity to contribute, uh, contribute to the world through architecture. I think in the, in the interest of time, we are going to have to uh, draw our morning session to a close. I would like to once again thank uh, Jonathan Nostrand and Michael Leckie for uh, sharing your time with us this morning. And also thanks to John McMinn for your introductory remarks and um, your support of, of this event and the process 